Great. Okay. This meeting is being recorded. Hello and welcome to today's tutorial. Today we have Ms. Kamashi Pandurajan, who is a CT1 in neurology based in Oxford, and she's going to be discussing urological emergencies. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are, are here or if you're, if you can hear me, just text that you can hear me. We can hear. Is there a chat that can be a bit more interactive or? We can hear. You can hear. Great. Is there a chat option? There is. I'll keep an eye on it as we go and uh, make sure that we discuss anything so that you don't have to stay chatting, uh, checking the chat. Great. Thank you. So um, I'm going to be covering urological emergencies today. So this is something that I see quite commonly in my job. Um, and as a, a CT1 just finishing now, um, it's quite important to know this information. I've tried to tailor it to um, what you need to know as a foundation doctor as well. And it's also for the watching medical students um, what to expect when you start F1. So emergencies are obviously quite important to know. And I think at your stage, it's just important to know that it is an emergency, just a bit of the basic management and to ask for senior support as soon as possible. So. This is what I'm hoping to cover in our, in our um, seminar today. So we're going to be talking a bit about acute scrotal pain, which is a very common presentation, uh, a little bit about paraphimosis, priapism, fourniose gangrene, and some basics of urological trauma. Um, this is what I'm hoping to cover. Obviously, if you have any other questions at the end, we can go over that as well. So we're going to do this as a um, as if that you're on call on a night shift and your nights are three days long and we're starting at day one. So, so far, so good. You've got a handover. It's about 9 p.m. and you get a call from the A&E doctors and they're referring to you a 19 year old male who's normally fit and well. And he's presented with an acute right scrotal pain. And it's a three hour history that he describes as an eight out of 10 pain that's woken him up from sleep. Now, this is something that's already concerning from hearing it on the other end of the phone. So we bring the patient in to assess him. And what else do you think that we need to know about him that would be helpful? Any history of trauma? Yeah, great. So we want to know this history of trauma because that could be very the very obvious reason why he's having the acute right scrotal pain. Um, other things that we need to know are like a urinary history. So we need to know if he's passing urine, if he is passing urine more often than normal, if his urine is dark. So basically we're thinking, could this be an infection that's causing the pain? Uh, another thing we need to know is someone's sexual history. So um, in this case, he could have a sexually transmitted infection and that could also be causing this similar kind of pain. We need to know if he's ever had any undescended uh, testicles in the past as a child, if he's had any scrotal surgery in the past. Um, and all of this is very relevant information that um, as the initial doctor assessing him, you would need to gather. So after we gather all this information, what are the main differentials that we're thinking about for him? Just knowing that he has acute right scrotal pain is enough to alarm you. Um, so what are we thinking? Anybody? Okay, so the main differentials that we're thinking in someone like this, um, we'll cover later, but we're thinking it's acute testicular torsion or epidermochitis possibly. So now the more information that we've gotten here from taking history is that he doesn't have any urinary symptoms like frequency, urgency, hematuria or incomplete voiding. And these are all the specific questions that you need to be asking somebody that comes in with this kind of presentation with the acute right scrotal pain. You know that they're able to give you a urine sample. So that's one of the initial things that you do to try and get a urine sample. Um, you know that now that he is sexually active, he has a single long-term partner with the use of protection. So the fact that he's sexually active doesn't necessarily immediately mean that he has a sexually transmitted infection. He's got a single long-term partner, which is a lower risk. He uses protection, again, a lower risk, and he doesn't have any previous STIs. So just something to be aware of in the back of your mind. Um, he's otherwise fit and well, so no other past medical history, so nothing else to be thinking about. 
He's a non-smoker, occasional alcohol use, and a uni student. So you see him in neurology with, your, with his partner. Now, when I assess patients like this and they come in with their partner or, or with anyone in general, it's helpful to take the sexual history when they're on their own because they tend to be more comfortable to give you that information. And also they might not give you the right information if they're with someone different. So just, just be mindful of that. Okay, so you examine him and you notice that he has some right scrotal swelling. He has a high riding, and by high riding, I mean one testicle is more elevated than the other testicle, retracted, and it's in a horizontal lie. So if you notice, this is, a, this is how a normal testicle lies. This is a vertical lie. If you have a horizontal lie, then it's, it's quite obvious and you'll be able to see it when you're examining somebody. And that is abnormal and we're worried about that feature. Chromosteric reflex. Now, th that's something I will go through, but when we have absent chromosteric reflex, again, it's a worrying feature in urology um, and a negative brain sign. Can anyone tell me what a chromosteric reflex is? When the testicle goes up by stroking the inner medial thigh. Exactly, yeah. Um, so in someone that doesn't have a chromosteric reflex, we're worried that this could be a torsion. And a negative brain sign. Um, any idea what a brain sign is? So a brain sign uh, is something that we actually mainly look for in epididymorchitis. When we elevate the testicle, they have relief of their pain. And that, that means that this is not a testicular torsion is more likely to be an epididymorchitis, and that's one way we can help differentiate. Obviously, these aren't so the chromosomal reflex and brain sign aren't um, a definite feature. So, as soon as you see an absent chromosomal reflex, doesn't mean they have torsion, it just means that you're more worried about them that they may have torsion. So, like I said, this is the normal lie of the testicle, this is the epididymis that just surrounds the back of the testicle. So when you're examining someone, it's very helpful to know the anatomy. And this is a spermatic cord just running down there and feeding into the epididymis. So say this person does have torsion, the testicle is more likely to look a bit like that. So you can see the engorgement, you can see the twisting of the spermatic cord. And when you do examine them, the actual testicle would, will be much more painful because the blood supply to the testicle has been compromised in comparison to the epididymis here being painful. And I'll just go through the chromosteric reflex in the next couple of slides. But are you worried about this person? I would definitely be worried with these features. So chromosteric reflex, exactly like you said, you would stroke the medial thigh here and this is the sensory and this is the motor. So the sensory fibers that it acts on are, are the fibers of the ilioinguinal nerve that just runs down here. And then the motor branch that affects the reflex, the muscle actually causing the contraction is the genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve. And just to give you an idea of how the chromosomal muscle works. So you can see the layer just here. And if you imagine this muscle contracting, then the testicle will be retracted up. OK, um, so just a bit of an anatomy break. Going back to this slide, so this is what the normal testicle looks like. We're just going to go through what the inside of the testicle, what the features look like. So here you have the seminiferous tubules, and this is where the sperm is actually produced. It goes into the retitestis and it collects there. And then it goes up into the epididymis, and you have the vas deferens coming here where the sperm collects and goes all the way up and actually connects underneath the seminal vesicles where semen is produced. So the sperm goes in and is added into the liquid that comes from the seminal vesicles and that makes the semen. So as you can imagine, the testicle is really important um, for men. And especially in a young man, we're, we're quite worried if they have to lose the testicle. So, and this is the surrounding layers of the testicle as well. So just going back here, we can see that the chromister muscle is one of the layers surrounding the testis, but here you can see in better detail. So this is the inguinal canal. You have the internal ring here, which is the deep ring. 
And then you have the external ring here, which is a superficial ring. So when you have hernias, and especially in direct hernias, this is where this is the channel that you're interested in. Now, the layers surrounding the testes are described here in quite good detail. And you can see that the testicle that used to be up there embryologically when it was formed comes down this tract with the help of the gubernaculum. So now in the scrotum, you've got these layers. And to figure out what these layers are, it actually is really useful to track them back to the abdomen. So the external spermatic fascia actually comes from the external oblique. The cremaster muscle comes from part of the transverse alus uh, abdominis as well as, as well as the internal oblique. And the internal spermatic fascia comes from the internal oblique. So if you learn the layers of the abdomen, the, the muscles in the abdomen, then it makes it quite useful to learn the layers around the testicle as well. So that's just to be aware of. So we got to this bit where we're worried about his examination findings and we have a 19 year old male and it's 9 p.m. at night and you've just seen him. So probably a good time to start discussing him with your seniors. So investigations. You've asked for a urine dip, which has just come back showing negative urine dips. So negative for nitrites, negative for leukocytes. So you, again, you're thinking he has no urinary features. So no urinary symptoms. He has a negative urine dip. So it's very unlikely that this is an infective episode. You want to ultrasound to get a better idea of what's going on in the testicles, but unfortunately there's no ultrasound available out of hours. Um, you do some bloods on him and they come back showing a white cell of nine. Okay, that's pretty normal. CRP15, which is slightly elevated and normal kidney function. Okay, so the investigations haven't given you as much information as you would have hoped apart from the fact that the dip is negative. So it's time for you to make a decision on how to manage this patient. So what would be the best way to manage this patient? So this is his history. Anybody? I think just carry on. Okay. So we're obviously thinking that this is torsion. And torsion is a clinical diagnosis. So it doesn't actually matter that we don't have an ultrasound finding torsion. Um, and actually where I work, we see, you know, at, at least I would say five or six of these cases uh, a week. And not all of them are torsion, but all of them present very, very similarly. Um, and examination findings are absolutely crucial in these patients because especially even within hours, we don't delay torsion diagnosis by an ultrasound because ultrasound can take time. Uh, it can be backed up. You might not be able to get the patient into a scan for three to four hours. And time is very, very crucial with these patients. So we don't rely on scans. We rely on just our examination findings and the history and sometimes the urine dip as well. So Again, like I said, this is the normal lie of the testicle, and this is the horizontal lie, just for demonstration. And this is the twisted spermatic cord. All the blood supply that's running here, the veins, the arteries, everything will be obstructed coming to the testicle. So we're worried about torsion. So this, this counts as a genuine surgical emergency, and you only have a four to six hour window to try and treat these patients optimally. So the treatment for them is always scrotal exploration. So if you can imagine, this 19-year-old has just come in in a lot of pain, very scared, and he's gone to A&E because that's usually the first place that patients go to when they're in a lot of pain, when they're worried about something going on. He goes to A&E and they see him and they're worried about torsion. So they give you a call. It's already been a few hours since he's had the pain and it's been another few hours before they've seen the patient and they've called you. So it's very, very easy to run out of this four to six hour window to try and save his testicle. So as soon as you get a phone call about someone that possibly might have testicular torsion, you would ask to see them right away. And you would try and get as much of the team aware of this patient and have everything ready for this patient. So the thing that we would like to do to treat them is an immediate scrotal exploration. So we need to have a look inside the scrotum to look at the testicle to see if it is twisted. Because as you remember, all we have is examination findings. We don't have a scan. And when we go in, if we see that, for example, he's complaining of right scrotal pain. So the right testicle is twisted. We go in and we do see the torsion. 
we untwist the right testicle and we have to fix it into place. So that's what we call an orchidopexy. So once we've fixed it in place and and we've you know finished with the right side, we always check the left side and we always fix the left side as well. Because if someone has a right side torsion, they're more likely to come back with a left side torsion. So while we're in there, we tend to fix both sides. Um, how we fix a testicle is basically on we do it what we call a three point fixation. We do a inferior and both sides. So we fix them both to the wall of the scrotum and then we make sure that we check the other side as well and we fix the other side, which is why we put bilateral orchidopexy plus minus proceed because this is very dependent on what we find within the scrotum. So say we go into the scrotum and we find that there's no torsion at all on the right or on the left. So we leave it be, we don't, we don't actually do anything. Um, and okay, say we go in and we see that the right side is twisted and it looks very unhealthy. The color is, is blue or purple. Um, it doesn't look like it's received any blood supply. Um, it's quite hard. Um, and even after you've untwisted it and given it some time to perk up, it doesn't perk up. So the proceed is, in that case, we might remove the right testicle. So that's an orchidectomy. Now, most men, can go just fine with one testicle. Um, they, the fertility isn't actually affected and they're still able to have kids. But if you imagine they now only have one testicle and if something does happen, say trauma to that testicle, um, testicular cancer, any of that happens, then it, it does affect their um, fertility and it is a worry for them. So we try our best to salvage every testicle that we can. And this is just, you know, quite a worrying fact for us to be aware of. Testicular salvage rates, they're 90 to 100 percent if the surgery is performed within six hours of the pain coming on. But as we discussed, a few hours after the pain comes on is when anybody, anybody would seek help. They wouldn't necessarily come, you know, within half an hour of the pain. And this decreases to 50 percent if the symptoms are present for more than 12 hours. So time is very, very crucial in this kind of presentation. And importantly, when you're consenting somebody for um, a scrotal exploration and orchidopexy, you need to make sure that you consent them for testicular atrophy. So there is a chance that we don't save the testicle. There is a chance that there is some damage to the testicle. There is a risk to future fertility. And also, and this is quite an important one to let them know about, that they may have chronic testicular pain. And this can be because we've damaged a nerve when we're in the operation. Um, and if that does happen, if they do end up with chronic testicular pain, this will be a recurrent and a long-standing problem um, that patients face. And we need to be clear with them that it's not just a few days, a few weeks, it could be lasting even a few months. So just to recap what we've done so far, We've had a 19-year-old male that's come in with acute right scrotal pain, a three-hour history. We've found out a bit more about him and we've, wor we're, we've examined him and we've covered the worrying features that we would normally see in testicular torsion, which is swelling, a high riding testicle, so a testicle that's been, if the cord is twisted, then the testicle itself is pulled up, an absent chromosteric reflex, which is when you sc stroke the middle medial part of the thigh and the testicle itself moves up. And we've gone through the brain sign, which is elevation of the testicle as well. So we've covered the management of what we think, what we think for um, testicular torsion. Now, another similar, very, very similar presentation for testicular torsion is someone coming in with a torsion of the hydrated of Morgagni. So now, I don't know if you've heard of this before, but looking back at the anatomy here, you can see the testicle and you can see an appendix of the testis, an appendix of the epididymis. Now, the hydrated of Morgagni is the appendix that we were referring to. It's not so common in older patients, but actually I've seen a 43 or is it 45, 40, mid 40s gentleman who's actually come in with very similar features of testicular torsion. We've taken him to theater as an emergency operation, looked into his scrotum and we found that he has a torsion of this. So this is an append 
an, an appendical appendiceal remnant. So it's a malarian duct remnant that you don't need anymore, but it's you know it's just there. Um, and in some people, this can get twisted, and this will also be very very painful, very very similar presentation to testicular torsion. Um, and in that case, we actually we just remove it. Um, use diathermy to just cut off the end of it, and that's it. Problem solved. Um, and how you can pick up the difference between a torsion and this is looking at this blue dot sign. So if you look at this picture, you can see that. Can you see that slightly pale blue sign? So that's something that when we're examining, we can look out for. But actually, it's quite a difficult sign to pick up and a very, very difficult one um, to to see and be confident that that's what's going on. And either way, we do need to go in and we, we do need to to un, untwist it and remove it because patients in a lot of pain to just let it be. Okay, so we've covered that. Now let's think about the, I guess, less serious differential of someone who come in, comes in with acute right scrotal pain. So acute scrotal pain and enlarged erythematous, very tender testicle, we're thinking it could be an inflammation of the epididymis or the testicles. Um, epidermorchitis is what we call it. So now the common reasons that you can get epidermorchitis is if you have a urinary tract infection or if you have an STI, which is the reason when the 19-year-old male comes in with the acute right scrotal pain, we ask them about these features because epidermorchitis also presents with quite a lot of pain and it can be difficult to differentiate between torsion and epidermorchitis. Um, epidermorchitis is quite common between the ages of 15 to 30 and more than 60, but testicular torsion, on the other hand, is not so common. It's only common up to the age of 25, say. So if you have a 60-year-old that's coming in uh, with this acute scrotal pain, we're thinking, okay, this is probably not torsion. This is more likely to be epidermorchitis. Examination findings that would help you to make this diagnosis are if the chromostatic reflex is intact and you have a positive brain sign, as we previously discussed. So you would routinely do some bloods for them. You would send their urine off for culture because it could be a urine infection. And you would you would do an STI screen for them slash refer them to the sexual health screening clinic. And obviously, in this case, you would ask them about their sexual history as well. So now for this patient, you have time to do an ultrasound. So you do an ultrasound and it shows increased vascularity of epididymis, maybe associated with hydrocele. So a lot of patients come in with hydrocele related pain or epidermalchitis also presenting with a hydrocele. So it's important to make that distinction. And complications of epidermalchitis, if you don't treat it properly, are that it can become a chronic infection. Um, and these patients are quite difficult to manage. So we, we currently have or had a patient on the ward um, with a chronic um, epidermalchitis that is very, very difficult to manage because no amount of analgesia seems to be able to help them. They feel that they're always in pain. Um, they feel they always have an infection. They're feeling poorly in themselves. But actually, you know, there isn't much that you can do when it gets to the chronic stage which is why it's really important when someone has acute epidermochitis that we treat them with the right antibiotics for the right length of time and we make sure that their infection has resolved. Um, another complication of not treating this properly is an abscess or reduced fertility. Now, with an abscess, there is you might need to get some source control. So you might need to drain the abscess around the testicle. Um, you might need to upscale their antibiotics to a better one, have discussion with microbiology about what would be best. Um, so these complications are quite, you know, tricky and we don't want to get there. So we want to pick these things up early. We want to be able to treat them properly as well. So management of epidermochitis. So if we're thinking it's more likely to do, to do with a urinary tract infection, um, which we tend to think in uh, above 35 year olds, we treat them with ciprofloxacin, um, this dose for this length of time. And if we're thinking it's more likely to do with a sexually transmitted infection, then we give them a, a stat dose of captriaxone, and then we give them a doxycycline 14 day course. So for both of these, we give a 14 day course, which is you know an abnormally long course that we give people um, antibiotics for. But it's important to know this difference. So it's not the same as treating a urinary tract infection. It's quite different. So 
in a female who's uncomplicated with a UTI, we give them three days. In a male, we give them up to seven days. And for epidermolkitis, we give, give, we, we give 14 days. Um, and we would always advise this patient to have a sexual health clinic referral and also abstain from any sexual activity until the symptoms resolve. Okay, so that is testicular torsion and epidermolkitis covered. So you're still on the first day of your night shift and it's now 2 a.m. You've just sorted the previous patient. Um, and now you have a 28 year old male who's come to a &E complaining of penile pain after sexual intercourse. And he's now unable to pull his foreskin back to position. So penile pain after sexual intercourse, okay, red flag. Unable to pull foreskin back to position, another red flag. So you transfer him over to your body triad because you want to see him urgently. So you see this gentleman and this is what it looks like. So this is the penis, this is the scrotum. The scrotum looks fine, doesn't look swollen. And one testicle always is higher than the other, which is normal for all patients. You just need to know which one and you ask them and they'll tell you. Now, if you look at the penis, you can see that there is a tight constricting band here. This is the foreskin that's basically unable to be pulled back up here. So we're thinking that this patient has paraphimosis. Now, paraphimosis is a urological emergency. It's something that you need to learn to detect. And this picture depicts it quite well, actually. Um, I've seen paraphimosis a lot worse than this and also a lot less, less worse than this. Um, it, can look a bit different when you see it in person for the first time. So it's important that if you're unsure that you ask your senior. So this is the foreskin covering the penis, as you can see, and this is the normal position of it in an uncircumcised male. And this is the bunched up foreskin here that's unable to go back. Now, the things that we normally expect in someone that can, comes in paraphimosis is they tell you that they can't retract the foreskin, obviously, um, as well as pain, swelling, Discoloration, if you see discoloration, then they're quite far down the line um, and the blood supply uh, is being compromised. So you're very worried at this point. Now, risk factors for paraphimosis is phimosis. So it's very important to know the difference between phimosis and paraphimosis. Phimosis is when the foreskin is tight. So patients tell you that they've always struggled to pull back their foreskin. And that is a complaint that they've had. And most kids tend to have it, but as you grow older, you grow out of that. Paraphimosis is an emergency. So paraphimosis is when you've pulled it, you've managed to pull the foreskin back, but you can't put it back into place. So you've pulled it all the way down here and you can't put it back. So that's the difference. And some of the other risk factors are if you've had a previous paraphimosis, okay, that makes sense. And if you have an indwelling urinary catheter. So now this one is very important for all of us. Um, we will be asked several times throughout our shift, throughout our career to put in catheters for patients. When we put in a catheter, it is very, very, very important that you pull the foreskin back to its original position over the glands before you finish the procedure. Because if you leave the foreskin like this here, then with time it will become swollen and it will become a paraphimosis. So we've heard a lot of cases and I've had lots of referrals um, from people in the community um, that basically have a long-term catheter in place and nurses go into the district nurses or whoever goes into their, their home to change the catheter for them, changes the catheter and a few um, hours later, or even 24 hours later, um, they come into a &E complaining that it's very painful, it's swollen, they can't pull the foreskin back. And that's because once you when you've put the catheter in, you've obviously pulled it back to put the catheter in. After the catheter, somebody's forgotten to replace it. And so this happens. And now, looking back at the history of this 28-year-old male, the, probably the likely risk factor here for him having paraphimosis is he might have had he might have had phimosis, so he might already have a tight foreskin from birth. And the second thing might be um, vigorous sexual activity can also cause this to happen. So it's very important when someone comes in that you try and find out the reason how this this happened, so you can counsel the patient and tell them that this is what's happened. 
So again, a good history is vital. So now paraphimosis is a urological emergency and we are very worried about it because if you have this, imagine this tight band, which obviously isn't letting any venous return, then the glands of the penis, it becomes very edematous and it makes it even harder to pull the foreskin back to its original position. And that can cause penile ischemia because the blood supply to the penis is obviously going to be compromised, which is why the discoloration is an important feature. If you have penile ischemia and you don't urgently reduce it, then they might lose the penis. So, you know, it's something that we are very, very concerned about. So it requires urgent reduction. Now, how do you reduce someone that has paraphimosis? So there are several steps to this procedure and I will try and go through it in a step-by-step -step format. Um, but first you want to you want to give this patient adequate analgesia because as you can imagine, this is very painful. And whatever manual reduction that you want to do, it won't be successful unless you give them a good anesthetic. They won't let you actually reduce them because they'll be in too much pain for it to work. So how do you do a dorsal penile nerve block? This is actually a really good block. And in theater for circumcisions routinely, we, use, we do use a dorsal penile nerve block so let's go through the anatomy just a little bit more to help. So if you can imagine, we're looking at this sagittal section. Uh, you can see that the pubic symphysis is here, this is the penis. And just looking within the penis, you can see this is the structures that we're looking at. So let me take you to a close up of it and we can talk through it in more detail. So you have the corpus cavernosum here and here. These are all spongy tissues, so one, two, three surrounding, uh, making the penis. So this is the corpus cavernosum, and this is also the corpus cavernosum, and this is the corpus spongiosum. And you can see here is the vascular supply. So you've got the deep dorsal penile vein and the superficial dorsal penile vein, and then you've got the penile arteries on either side, and you've got the nerve here and here. So if you imagine, oh, and you have the Buck's fascia. So this is important to know that it encompasses these structures. So the fascia just limits any spread of, you know, a hematoma, an infection, it just keeps it within that compartment. So going, so what we want is actually the anesthetic to reach the dorsal nerve of the penis, which is here and here. So we want to be in this space, but we don't want to hit these structures. So a bit of a balance really. How do we deliver the dorsal penile nerve blocks? So we need to know our anatomy, obviously. So we've gone over the basics of the anatomy. We've gone over where we want the injections to be. So if you can see here, the nerves here and here, and that's where we want the needles to go in. So how do we go about inserting that? We look for the pubic symphysis. So you can feel the pubic symphysis quite easily in most people. So you direct your needle with obviously the um, local anesthetic. Um, straight in as if you're going to hit the pubic symphysis. Once you get to the point where you're about to hit the pubic symphysis, you direct your needle without taking it out of the skin to this side and this side, so laterally on either side. You retract to make sure that you're not in a vessel so you don't get any blood drawing back into your syringe and then you inject. So you inject once on the side and once on the side. And then just to be certain, some people also use a ring block, which basically use the same needle, but you inject along the base of the penis like that in a ring fashion. So that's the dorsal penile nerve block. Now it's very, very important to know whether, so when we're picking a local anesthetic that we pick one without adrenaline. So the reason for this is any end organ um, that we try and anesthetize, adrenaline can cause vasoconstriction of vessels and you can have end organ ischemia. So again, in this patient, we're already worried about ischemia. We don't, we don't use adrenaline um, to actually inject into the superficial tissues. That's just with the nerve, yeah? So this is the picture, um, just going through the anatomy again, just so that you're aware. Now, once we've given the local anesthetic, we actually come down to the reduction. So how do we reduce someone with paraphimosis? So we want to compress the penis. So just grab it like that, how they are in that picture. And we hold, we, we can hold it up to, you know, 10 minutes even to make sure that the swelling goes down. When we think that the swelling has gone down, then we try and reduce it this way 
with this kind of motion. I know it looks weird and it, it's not intuitive, but once you do it once, it will make so much more sense. Um, and you can start reducing paraphimosis quite easily after that. Um, next, if this doesn't work, so you've tried manual reduction and it doesn't work, try some sugar. So mix some dextrose with some lidocaine, soak the gauze with the dextrose and wrap it around the glands because it allows for osmotic pressure to draw out the edema from the glands which makes it easier for the foreskin to be pulled back. Um, and you can basically soak it, cover it and wait for an hour. So a lot of people are quite impatient. And I think with the compression here, you need to wait for quite a long time. And again, with this, you need to wait quite a long time. And this method, these methods, they do work. It just takes a lot of time. It takes patience um, and some skill. Um, so you wait an hour and then you attempt manual reduction. So as you can imagine, I've just gone through how, how much of an emergency this is. So waiting an hour to try this dextrose, you know, it, it can be something that you weigh against. You may decide, actually, you know, I don't think that this is gonna help. And I think that waiting another hour is going to make things worse for this patient. So some people tend to, you know, skip this step if they feel that way. Now this technique, a little bit more gruesome than the other two, unfortunately, um, is called the Dundee technique. And as it shows here, you use needles to puncture indirectly into the glands penis and you try and drain the fluid. You basically squeeze out as much fluid as you can and then you try and manually reduce just like you would here again. Now, if this doesn't work, you know, we are quite worried at this point. If this doesn't work, we the only other option is to take the patient to theater or you can do it under a local block if the block is good enough, but we tend to take the patient to theater to do this. So you incise the foreskin. So as you can see here at the 12 o'clock position and that helps to relieve the swelling and then you can put the foreskin back. Um, after this has happened, after you've got the foreskin back, um, something that you need to discuss with the patient is if they would like to consider a circumcision. Um, in some centers, they would consider an emergency circumcision, but it's not the best for cosmesis. Um, and patients might be might be more likely to pick that option just to have one surgery and be be done with this whole process and not have to worry about having another episode of paraphimosis again. And some may say, actually do the dorsal slit and I'll wait for my circumcision to have good cosmesis. And some might say, I don't want I don't want a circumcision, just have the dorsal slit and that would be it. Um, okay, so we've covered paraphimosis. So we have talked about a 28 year old male coming with penile pain after sexual intercourse. We've discussed that that is a risk factor that he has. He might also have phimosis, which is a foreskin being tight. We've gone through the features of paraphimosis and the risk factors to be, wary of, to be wary of. And especially for us as doctors, an indwelling catheter is, is you know, something that should never happen. We should never leave somebody with paraphimosis after we put a catheter in. So always, always be mindful of pulling the foreskin back to its original position before you leave. Um, we've discussed that it's an emergency and we need to reduce and we've gone through the basics of how to put a dorsal pain on nerve block. So if you're ever in the situation and um, you're with a senior, you could ask them, could I, could I learn to put this block? And now you have the basic anatomy and knowledge about how to do, how to theoretically do the block and then you can practice it in person. Um, so steps to reduce uh, a paraphimosis. So the first thing to try is compress and reduce in this method, so manual reduction. Then you try some sugar. Then you try the Dundee technique. And eventually it's a dorsal slit. 